Welcome everyone, my name is Paweł Raiva and it's a great honor for me today to have Professor De Meller and Dr. Vandenberg to talk about biochemical recurrence in prostate cancer. It's a pleasure, so thank you. My first question is, how do you define biochemical recurrence in 2025 and if there are any stratification factors in, in this setting? I can answer that. I think that in the past the PSA of 0.2 threshold has been used often. The guidelines have well omitted that threshold in the past few years. I think that any rising PSA after a curative therapy could be defined as biochemical recurrence. Um, it is important to realize that that group of BCR is a very heterogeneous group, either after surgery or after radiation. Uh, men who were treated last year or men who were treated 10 years ago with high Gleason scores, low Gleason scores. And I think important information has been derived from the EU guidelines review on this subject, trying to define risk criteria mm -hmm. and risk mm -hmm. groups. And for surgery, that is a combination of Gleason score and PSA doubling time. And after radiation, it is the time interval after treatment uh, combined with, uh, with Gleason score. Yep. So this is a way to define whether somebody's low risk or high risk. Perfectly agree. Just one little, it's not a comment, but it's a, a little wa warning also to myself. You need one reconfirmation often. Because it's not unregularly that you see somebody with a rising PSA till, for instance, 0 0.14, and four weeks later it's 0 0.08. Yeah. It happens. So confirmation, I think, is uh, important. I agree. I think that the definition should not be about a certain PSA threshold, but about the confirmation that you have two or maybe even three PSAs that show an increasing yep. uh, trend. And I think that should be the definition. Although there's no clear definition in the guidelines at this, at this moment. Okay, so thank you very much. And how do you see the role of PSMA PET in biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer? So for me, I think it's important to follow like a stepwise approach. Um, first look at the patient, not only at the tumor. If somebody has a high age or different comorbidities, <clears throat> you should consider if you do any kind of imaging because that imaging may not have a clinical impact later. But if you think that any self therapy could be indicated later, I think PSMA has been the game changer uh, that has been introduced over the past years. It's far from perfect but it helped us tremendously to differentiate if the biochemical recurrence was a local problem, a lymph node problem, or a metastatic problem. I cannot even imagine or, or not. how people oh. worked without PSMA Blind, in the past. Blind, <laughs> but, uh, I fully agree again. Um, now, what is very important in PSMA is, and this has been shown by the group of Thomas Wiegel one year ago, it's very important if you do a post prostatectomy PSMA, because you have a biochemical recurrence and it's negative. But on the same level, you have positive surgical margin or PT3 disease. A negative PSMA is never a reason not to go for early salvage radiotherapy. This is really important because nowadays we see sometimes we see nothing, so we, do, we don't do anything. This is wrong. Okay, this is important. Yeah, two, two. Uh, you have you, you should only perform a PSMA PET CT, Roderick, like you said. If you would change your treatment, if your PSMA shows something that you don't expect, for instance, you see a lymph node after surgery, then you should include the lymph nodes in the treatment field of radiotherapy, or we send them to you to operate on. That's another discussion. But but not you don't perform a PSMA to just do it. You have to give consequences on that. I think this is the most important. Yeah. And yeah. three, do not make pa patients more sick than they are based on PSMA. Uh, this every year, two, three cases that have come out without being prostate cancer. You mean the false positive? Yeah, uh, don't outcomes, underestimate yeah. that. Yeah. And I agree with you, it can be tempting to use your PSMA when it's negative, delay self therapy until Maybe you see a lesion on PSMA, but that's not the way to go because no, we know no. that only the larger lesions are visible. So I think it should be used to rule out metastatic disease. And if you're, well, more or less sure that metastatic disease is present, then you can choose yourself with therapy yep, yep. either after surgery, radiation or whatsoever. And in a case, I would say in low risk biochemical recurrence, do you think we can still like repeat PSMA PET or like certain 
For, for yeah. Lotus Biochemical Recurrence, I don't know exactly what you're heading at, but then I would never do a PSMA at the level of 0 0.2. Uh, I mean, don't forget PSMA, it's not too, uh, well, it's rather expensive, but two, uh, the, the, the places are limited. So if you go for low volume or low, mid, low risk patients and you send them all to the PSMA scans, then your waiting list for those who need it is growing. And this is becoming an ethical issue. So for low risk biochemical recurrence, I would maybe not even consider a PSMA. And so repeat it, I don't know. Now again, follow a stepwise approach. Look yeah. at the patient first, yeah, look yeah. at his life expectancy, look at his comorbidities. Is that a candidate for any self therapy? If yes, then try to make a risk assessment based on these EAU risk classification, EAU low risk versus high risk. For the low risk cases, we know that any self therapy is unlikely to impact their long term oncological endpoints, that they are most likely the high risk cases that yeah. benefit salvage therapy. Um, and for a low risk, repeating it, it, it doesn't make sense to me because you make it, you do the PSMA to rule out metastatic disease. And if you, after that, do not act on it, you, you can you, question yourself why you yeah, have been doing it. You should be careful not to have the abbreviation that PSMA is patient stress multiplier and yeah. activator. Huh? Yeah. I mean, don't, don't underestimate this. And regarding the treatment, actually, how should we treat biochemical recurrence? prostate cancer well if it's after prostatectomy then uh, then we go for if, if the patient agrees upon the treatment and salvage radiotherapy to the prostate then it depends on whether the colleague of urology has performed an extended limb node dissection or not to include the lymph nodes or not and we add most of the time six months of uh, hormonal treatment it be ADT so chemical castration and or bicalutamide which is a very good radio sensitizer we know that new molecules are there, but they are not reimbursed yet and they are much too expensive. So they won't be reimbursed very soon in my country. If your PSMA shows a metastatic spot, then it depends on oligo versus polymetastatic. And then it, well, we put them in studies on metastasis directed therapy, which is, I think, becoming more and more the standard of treatment. We now talk biochemical records after prostatectomy, but don't underestimate that you see it after bracket therapy and external beam therapy too, local disease. And I think that Roderick, you should answer that question, what you perform then. So there are a lot of options, there are a lot of clinical scenarios here. You have different treatments, surgery, brachii, external beam radiation therapy. And within that scope of biochemical recurrence, it can be a local problem, it can be a lymph node problem, yeah, yeah. it can be a distant metastatic problem. You can try to find the right treatment for the right scenario and then even consider hormones, yes or no. So if you multiply that, you have like 40 <coughs> scenarios which all are bundled into that biochemical recurrence yeah. situation. You were referring to the situation after BRCA therapy? Yeah, or, or external, external beam, beam radiotherapy. External yeah. beam radiation. So I think if it's a lymph node problem or a distant metastatic problem, I think there is not a good reason to treat them differently from the ones who had a prostatectomy. Correct. Uh, as long as they're like with a normal testosterone level and not within that uh, yep. ADT combined with the no, primary no, treatment not, yeah. phase. But if it's a local problem, of course, then it's quite challenging. You can do HDR brachii, you can even do salvage prostatectomy. But again, and this is my third time mentioning this, please look at the patient whether he will benefit exactly. or whether you're going to ruin his quality of life. Yeah, one of the issues is now that men live longer, however, what, what, whatsoever. So most of them are still alive 10, 15 years after primary treatment, for instance, radiotherapy, prostate cancer. So we will see an increase in local relapses. Mm -hmm. I think even that some of the local relapses after radiotherapy are radiotherapy induced yeah. secondary tumors. But then the guys are 80 plus, and then most of the time, and this is something we didn't mention very clearly, do nothing is also an option. Yeah. And, and I think a clinical challenge is also that men within a few years after, homo, or after uh, radiation therapy will still show some activity on PSMA. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and even the radiation oncologists are not always sure whether that's part of the treatment effect or whether that's a recurrence. So I think in this scenario, well, PSMA can also be confusing. We, we, for, for us in that scenario, uh, uh, biopsy is mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. before you go for, for salvage treatments. But, 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 but because you, you're clearly interested in PSMA, it, it, I think the good thing is that it has made 
by doing this paradigm shift and you find advanced disease, albeit lymph nodes or METs earlier, that the, that the prognosis of nodal disease and metastatic disease compared to 20 years ago is much better because yeah. you find it earlier. Of course. It's an upstaging. Yeah. It's an upstaging. And, and this is good news. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you, you don't do it to do nothing afterwards. Okay. No, and I think it, it, that will be my last comment. But two, it works two ways. You can either uh, direct the better treatment mm. for mm. the scenario, but also avoid unnecessary treatments. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a double that's, effect. That's correct. I mean. I, I, and avoid uh, unnecessary volumes. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is important. But it's, it's the best thing we have and it's there to stay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think about, you know, you mentioned it, intensified treatment. So new RPs, can they replace ADT or how do you see it in the biochemical recurrence setting? Well, I had the same question this morning and uh, I, I had a pragmatic answer. I think uh, they will replace ADT on two conditions. They have to be reimbursed and they will only be reimbursed if they are much, much cheaper because in my country, and I think the Netherlands is the same more or less, we are, we are quite a, a healthy country, but ADT costs, for instance, 500 euros a month while ARTA costs 3,000, 4,000 euros a month. The government will never accept. Oh. But from a biological uh, uh, mechanism, I think it's fair logic that, that they will come at the first place because they have a better tolerance. But money is also a, a tolerance level. <laughs> so I think in this biochemical situation, you, you have two scenarios. One is that you try to treat the oligometastatic disease. Yep try to cure as many metastases to slow down the disease, uh, to delay the indication for ADT. And the other scenario, and I think that will be the high risk cases with a quickly rising PSA, like the, like the Embark, like yeah. patients with yeah. a quickly yeah. rising PSA, then my gut feeling would be that you can radiate the oligometastatic disease, but then the delay will be very short. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, moment yeah. that you will have to start ADT is close anyway, and if you know that it is so likely that you will need ADT in the future, I think these are the cases that benefit from early intensification yeah, yeah. Yeah, combining yeah. ADT. But I think the field where both oligometastatic treatment plus intensified ADT, I think that's the challenge for the that's next few years to, yeah, yeah, to combine yeah. it and to yeah. find the right for, scenarios. For instance, like you said, some of the RPs in my country, and I think in other countries too, are only reimbursed in embark-wise or like patients, so you have a rising PSA with short doubling time, and you don't have metastatic, so non-metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, then you can add it. But this is a minority of the cases. Yeah. Of course. So actually, what do you think are the future directions in the treatment of biochemical recurrence prostate cancer? Like, how do you see it? How will treat biochemical recurrence in five to 10 years? So I think that intensified treatment for the highest risk cases will move on. It, 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 it goes for many of the decision-making moments within prostate cancer. We need to individualize and risk stratify and then de-escalate in the ones who do well and intensify in the highest yeah. risk cases. And that intensification can be a combination of treatment of the metastatic disease using oligometastatic radiation mm -hmm. uh, combined with intensified hormonal therapy. And I think that the de-escalation should be the low risk cases um, that may not benefit any self therapy. I think it's important to realize that we are working and doing our best efforts to find the right treatment for the right patients in the primary situation. Mm -hmm. And we should be just as careful in the recurrent situation, not to over treat, not really to find the right treatment. In that sense, I think I will be, I think I will be retired at that point, but I, there's a lot of things are going on in genetics and epigenetics in, 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 in predicting whether you as a patient will respond to salvage treatment or not, and within the response, whether you will need intensification or not. So I think that this will be a part of the future. So integrating molecular uh, information into treatment decision-making. It's yeah. not there yet, but you, you asked within yeah, 10 of years. I think, I think from a technical point of view, the, the treatments of, of urologists will uh, fine tune more and more, just as we do. We will have more and more systemic treatments, but like Roderick said, the issue will be who needs what. Yeah, we should. One size yeah. fits it all; it's, it's gone. Yeah. And you can you can intensify, of course, with with RCs. Yeah. But you can also intensify with radiolicon therapy okay. in an early phase. So, yeah. 
for instance, if, if you have a, a, a man with a huge P53 um, um, uh, genetic uh, disorder, he will not respond or respond very poorly to radiotherapy because P P53 mutations are a marker of radio resistance. So then you can say mm, better not to treat with radiotherapy. The, you see, and this information will more and more be integrated, I think, in the general medical dossier of, uh, of the patient. And then we use like PSA, PSA doubling time, of number of methods tests on PSMA. But for me, that is still a very primitive way of risk stratifying the disease. Yeah, we yeah, need yeah. molecular predictors. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the future is. That's not only for biochemical recurrent disease but for many of the decision-making moments in, in prostate cancer management. Just counting the number of metastatic disease, I think that's not sufficient. I cannot live with no, that for the future, no, but, no, it's, but it's the best we have now. Yeah. So ask us again in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your insightful talk. It was a great pleasure. And, and actually, I am looking to the future of, of treatment of biochemical recurrence in prostate cancer. It was a pleasure for me. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Bye-bye. Thank you.